On this episode of SSI Executive Conversations, Brian Stegall of Shurig Solutions meets with Erin Feeney. Erin is a Chief Commercial Officer currently looking for her next role. Previously, she worked her way up from a sales rep to a C-suite position. On this episode, they talk about Erin's journey, the research and development roadmap, and the age of digital communications. Hey, we are very excited today uh, to have uh, Aaron Feeney on the SSI Executive Conversations podcast. Uh, Aaron's a, a dynamic life sciences and biotech executive uh, who brings extensive experience in early stage commercialization organizations. Recently, in her role as 4D Paths Chief Commercial Officer, Aaron's expertise building sales and market access teams across specialty areas, including liquid biopsy, oncology, and women's health. Uh, which played a critical role in advancing the commercial strategy and development of 4D Paths cancer diagnostic and precision oncology platform technology. Uh, Aaron's most recently served as Vice President of Sales North America at Sophia Genetics, as well as Vice President of Sequencing Sales at Genuity Science and Vice President Global Sales Clinical Genomics at Seracare Life Sciences. Uh, she received her BA in Communications and political science at the University of Pittsburgh. Aaron, thanks so much for uh, joining us today. Thanks, Brian. Really happy to be here. That's awesome. Well, hey, listen, you and I have had multiple conversations, and I love your story. Um, <laughs> you know, it's the classic yet unconventional uh, work, uh, work your way up the ladder story. And uh, I know that it definitely inspires me, and I think it will definitely resonate with the, with the audience that's listening. You know, from sales rep to chief commercial officer, Share with us a little about how, how do you do that? Yeah, I, I'm so excited to have the chance to talk to you today about some of my experiences. And, you know, it is a, a rather circuitous route that I took to get from sales rep to, to where I am today um, with a lot of, you know, twists and turns along the highway. But suffice to say that I knew very early on after I finished uh, college that I wanted to do something in healthcare. I had a huge amount of interest and um, tons of medical professionals in my family all around me didn't really want to do the medical school thing myself. So the next best thing for me was really getting into more of a sales type of a role. So was able to get in to, to pharmaceutical sales pretty early after graduation and worked my way through sales rep positions into district sales manager roles and then into market access and even some field marketing roles and really liked that and really um, it, it was it was a, a great place for me to satisfy my continuous my thirst for continuous learning if you will right. um, one of the things that always propelled me was I loved the job that I was doing but I was very interested in what the next thing would be so I was very keen on shadowing where I could folks that had the next role or the role that I was interested in and in the case of you know my first sales rep role, I really wanted to be a hospital sales rep after calling on clinicians in their offices. And so I found um, a gentleman that was in the hospital sales part of Santa Fe, uh, sorry, Burroughs Welcome, where I worked at the time. Um, and I was allowed to shadow him for two days. I learned a lot and worked really hard to be able to get myself moved into that, that selling role. So I kind of have done that my whole career. The other thing that I'll say that's really helped me is, is just really being open to crazy things like, <laughs> you know, like, like jobs that, you know, I never thought that I would ever be qualified to do, but somebody thought that I was, and they threw me in the deep end of the pool and I loved it. Um, not to say I didn't have sleepless nights and I have a few gray hairs um, trying to we figure it did. out along the way. Right. But it was, um, it was really a willingness to be brave um, and, and try new things. And, and I really have also had a knack because I, you know, I do my job and I do a lot of reading and do a lot of things that are pertinent to my job. But I'm one of those geeks on the off time that I'm I'm reading about what the next best best next best technologies are and everything coming up um, on my free time. So, um, you know, I was able to enter the lab business after a really nice career in pharma. And that's a very different sell from a regulatory standpoint. But but really, diagnostics touches every part of patient care from you know, just new, new, um, new babies all the way to, to, you know, the casket, basically, um, <laughs> right. you're, involved, you're involved in everything. Diagnostics are involved in everything. And so, um, was able to come into the lab role as a sales manager. And at that point, I really realized that 
there's so much collaboration amongst all the ancillary teams in a, in a laboratory company to help a sales team be successful. That's everything from marketing to client success to R&D to um, regulatory and quality assurance. All of those areas are really crucial and have to be working lock and step with sales folks and ultimately with customers and ultimately down the line patients to make sure that patients are getting the right care at the right time and um, that mistakes aren't made because diagnosis um, is a life or death issue in many cases. Right. So, you know, that's kind of how I ended up in lab and then, you know, selling lab services or managing teams, building teams that sold lab services for many years was very rewarding, especially um, being one, working with the company that launched the first non-invasive prenatal genetic test ever on the on the globe. Um, wow. was very, very highly excite, exciting and um, groundbreaking. And so was able to be very successful in that role. And then I kind of got interested in what goes on on the other side of the bench, right? <laughs> right. So there's the bench science that I'm not, I'm not a scientist. I'm, I don't propose to be, don't pretend to be not a scientist, but fascinated by how it works on the other side. Um, so from a quality assurance perspective, from uh, how do the tests get developed? How do you validate the tests? Who's involved in validation? All those sorts of things became very interesting to me. And so I moved over um, you know, a number of years ago into the tool side of the business. So with Sarah Care, it was um, biosynthetic reference materials and controls, and then moving into software as a service with Genuity and, and now 4D Path, which is, I think, the future of where we're going with um, uh, AI machine learning, uh, particularly in the software as a service um, yeah. situation. So, you know, it, it's amazing how complex the process is that, 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 you know, people don't necessarily realize. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I definitely want to circle uh, back around with you on, on that, that courage part and the curiosity and the termination piece mm -hmm. in a bit. But, you know, what, what I really wanted to, to hit on is something you said about, and you've talked about it before with, with me, the, the R&D roadmap. Yeah. You know, quite frankly, what does that have to do with sales and commercialization? They're totally different departments uh, with different focuses and objectives you know, how, you know, the collaboration, how does that work? Well, it's really, you know, you would maybe on the service think that, but it really isn't, they really can't, in, they can't operate independently. Right. So in order for a salesperson or a sales team to be effective in moving revenue and, and moving a testing methodology or platforms into the clinical setting, you have to have a product that's going to be readily accepted and adopted by the clinician on the other end. And so how do you know what that product needs to have? How many genes in a gene panel? How, you know, what conditions do you need to test for in a, in a um, non-invasive prenatal test? Those kinds of questions have to be answered before R&D really sets to work doing what they're doing. Um, I think initially the R&D idea is there. And so the beachhead product or the first product may be built on that idea. Right. But especially in software as a service where you're constantly updating the technology and the platform and um, adding new features, sales and commercialization has to have a seat at that table during the roadmap planning because resources are finite, right? There isn't, most companies don't have unlimited resources to go run in 45 different directions right. when they're figuring out what their next product's going to be on their roadmap. So understanding where the uptake can be, how long will that take? What's the reimbursement landscape? All of those yes. kinds of questions have to be answered um, at, at the same time that the R&D folks are figuring out what their priorities are. I, I give a, I always like to tell this little story about uh, my time at Seracare because as an initial member of the clinical um, genomics group at Seracare, we had unbelievably brilliant scientists that are still there, believe it or not, but amazingly brilliant of the best I've ever seen. And they, and scientists inherently want to solve problems and are very interested in the really hard problems, right? But sometimes the really hard problems aren't the ones that are gonna keep the lights on in this short term. So we got into the practice of having these R&D, you know, summits twice a year where you did have all the stakeholders sitting at the table um, to discuss what the next six months, year, three years, even five years was going to look like from product development. And that included, you know, uh, what is the market, what's market research telling us coming out of the marketing department? What's, what is, what are the sales reps hearing from the clinicians that are using the existing products? 
Um, all of those kinds of pieces of feedback were put into, into play. And then the scientists also had their own priorities that they personally and professionally wanted to pursue. And so it was really interesting because our head of R&D had them all really have to put together presentations and make the case for why their project that they wanted to work on for the next six months or a year was the one we should move forward with. So they would put together, you know, PowerPoint presentations that included market research and reimbursement landscape and working, you know, obviously getting that information from all the other groups that were seated at the table, but really making the full business case for why we're making an R&D decision. So I that really cemented in my mind how important it is for um, those decisions to not be made in a vacuum um, and, and to have as much feedback, especially from the grassroots level as you can. Yeah. So the scientist becomes the sales rep in heaven, right. right? And they, you know, they, it's funny, I, everywhere I've ever been, especially on the lab side of the business, there is an energy that comes from sales teams that is very infectious in organizations. And so I would always have my sales meetings in headquarters because I wanted that energy to come off of my teams and infect the rest of the organization. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because yes. if you sit in a lab or you're on the bench all day long, sometimes it can be easy to lose sight of what you're doing all this for, yeah. which is the patient at the end of the day. And yeah. so the sales reps are closest to that. And I think um, they just provide this energy that people got to look forward to when, when the sales teams were coming in-house for quarterly business reviews or national sales meetings or whatever. They they really looked forward to it and they really looked forward to award ceremonies, which is very weird, but they did because they, that was when they really felt that the stuff that they were doing every day was making a difference in, in people's yeah. lives, not just the sales reps, but the patients that are getting treated yeah. on the other end. Really yeah. rewarding. Amazing concept. Yeah. I, I definitely think that's advantageous for, for, you know, organizations for that type of collaboration Yep. Um, you know, and I know that's obviously made you successful in, in that ladder that, that you've, you know, brought those things to the table for organizations. Um, it, you know, you with 4D Path, you, you, you recently developed and executed the commercial launch plans for a first in class white box AI digital pathology SaaS platform. That's a mouthful. That's a, that's a tongue twister. <laughs> it is. I tell you. Uh, and, 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 you know, we all in this industry, uh, we know that AI is the buzzword. Uh, right now. And so, so walk us through your insight on, on obviously this hot topic yep. and how you see it playing a vital role in the future. Yeah. So I think there's tremendous potential with AI, particularly, particularly in the digital pathology space for a number of reasons, not the least of which is that there are, we're approaching sort of really dangerous low levels of pathologists across the world. There aren't there aren't as many pathologists as, as we're going to need as cancer rates increase and, and more and more diagnostics are developed. So it's really imperative that we find a way to bring AI and machine learning into the digital or into the pathology workflow so that we can take some of the pressure off of the pathologists in terms of triage. So where should they be spending most of their time? Are they on the run of the mill things that anybody can can find, or should it be on the more rare things that AI and machine learning really provide very helpful adjunctive tools to help pathologists to really focus on what they're seeing? So I think if there's tremendous uh, opportunity there, there are some barriers that we still have to get over um, because the science is kind of moving yeah. faster than a lot of the um, other yes. gatekeepers as, as usually is the case. So um, in order to get an institution to adopt digital pathology in the first place, there has to be a way for them to recoup or to um, realize uh, the cost, the, the capex, capex that they're going to spend to bring digital pathology in, which includes scanners and uh, different workflows and all kinds of new equipment that they wouldn't necessarily have. And, and to that end, so that's an expensive endeavor, but then you have to be able to bill for this. And up until January, there really were no CPT codes that a pathologist could bill for anything related to digital pathology. Right. Forget about right. AI for a second. Just yeah. digital, the, the work that goes into involve, the work that goes into preparing slides to be scanned right. and then digitally maintained and all of that. There, up until January were no codes. Now there are 12 codes that have been implemented in January and, and they're sort of wait and see type of codes. They're not, they don't have a payment of value attached sure. to them yet. 
but they're really to look at utilization and hopefully move them towards more class one codes, but or class A codes. But um, the the bigger piece is the AI um, platform that 4D Path has, as well as others like Page uh, Page AI, Path AI, um, are really very specific tests for um, biomarkers in can various forms of cancer. Our product, our beachhead product, is in breast cancer, and so. Really, in order for this to really see adoption at the clinical level, it's going to require a CPT code. It's going to require, mm -hmm. in many cases, FDA approval or FDA clearance. Um, and that's another thing. So you've got the payers that don't know what to do with this yet. And then you've got FDA that really still is on the pathology side of things, still learning, still figuring things out. There's really only one uh, a, uh, FDA approved AI product in pathology right now. It's Page Prostate. It's their their um, their test for prostate cancer. But um, radiology has tons, tons and tons of FDA clearances for AI products. So so the the, the pathway is there. It just right. needs to happen. And unfortunately, because the capex, it's the chicken and the egg issue, right? You, you can't really expect anybody to spend all this money outside, you know, outside of an acad academic institution. You do see digital pathology really in most every major academic institution and in many of the larger cancer centers. Right. You see it. But in order for the, the more community cancer centers and the, the, the more community based hospitals, in order for them to make this shift, um, there's going to have to be a pathway to reimbursement. And we're just sure. not quite there yet, but getting there. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, you know, interesting, you know, we're talking about technology and, and, you know, AI playing, you know, with the pathologists and definitely not taking that particular person's, you know, role over, but as a support mechanism, really, you know, to, to, to help them with that. Um, Brian, that's a, if I could just interject, that's a really important point, because I think yeah. that is something that AI is a little scary and AI is not very well understood, even in the pathology market, right. right? So there's black box AI, there's white box AI, there's explainable AI. No one really totally understands what all of those terms mean, or I should say, they all have their own way of expressing what those things mean to them. Um, so it is, it's really important for us as an industry to do a much better job of educating on what AI can and cannot do. And AI is never going to replace a pathologist. It's really important to say that, and it's the truth, because it's never going to, to beat the eyes on the slide. Um, yeah. And pathologists, once they get it, once once they become reassured that this is not, you know, robot, robots, robot, sorry, robots are not coming into the lab to take over <laughs> right. to help them to be more efficient. And also digital pathology opens up a whole new revenue stream for institutions, because all of a sudden now, if you want to get a second opinion, from a hospital in China that may have expertise in a biomarker or in this particular cancer that you're looking at, you can send those slides through the cloud and Absolutely. you can get a second opinion. It's a revenue stream for an institution, another thing to think about and that institutions are dealing with when they are making the business decision about bringing this in-house. Yeah, that. thanks for, for going a step further in that because that I think that's really important. And that, that kind of segues into, you know, another thing I was interested, you know, we're in a digital world and you and I grew up in sales, right? And it was always, let's go shake hands face to face. Well, now with Zoom and Teams and, and, and that sort of thing, you know, internal, external meetings and non-personal promotion, you know, how important do you think it still is to, to really establish FaceTime in our business, particularly from a commercial perspective? Yeah, I think it's it's absolutely crucial now that we're out of the COVID um, pandemic and people are getting back to to yeah. being able to freely move about the country and the world. I think it's really important to get back on the wagon, so to speak. I, I think nothing beats seeing the whites of people's eyes. Nothing yeah. helps build trust more than shaking somebody's hand and sitting down and getting immediate feedback to whatever you're presenting or questions that you're asking. You know, you get a little bit of that and we've made do with it right. digitally over the last couple of years. But honestly, really nothing beats FaceTime. I've always thought that. And I, I, I really think true salespeople um, do want to be out in front of their customers. Oh, they oh yeah. They don't oh. want to be sitting in the screen all day. <laughs> so I don't think it's that much of a hard sell. I, it's, it's a little harder on the customer side, I'll say. In the last sure. you know year or so, a lot of customers have gotten really used to not 
seeing people face to face. So it's sometimes a little bit of the twisting of the arm um, or, you know, going to conferences and meeting them at conferences and, and build, starting to build the relationships that way. I mean, I think that's also a really effective way, but yeah. we have to get back to the face to face because I just, again, the trust, it, it's a trust thing for me. Uh, and I believe it is for a lot of uh, customers. I think they buy from people that they trust. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, and, you know, so now talking about, you know, our last three years, let, let's look towards the future a little bit. You know, what are two for people who want to potentially get in here and, yeah. you know, what are two or three life skills uh, that, that a younger person yeah. Um, yeah. need to have, uh, you know, highly developed uh, in order to, yeah. to really move through the executive ranks kind of like kind of like you did? Yeah, I think. Well, for, the first thing that comes to mind is professionalism. I, I, I you know, hate to say anything about appearance, but appearances do matter. And so really how you present yourself really, I think, makes a difference. I've been hiring people for a long time. And I can tell you that the folks that pay a little bit more attention to how they are presenting themselves um, go a little bit further in processes than those that, that don't. Um, so that's, that's one. I would say another one is continuous and constant curiosity have to be curious about what you're doing, what your what your business is about, what your competitors are doing. I think the sharpest folks are the ones that really are thinking not four degree chess, but you know, a few steps ahead of, of where they are and where they want to be. And, and I think along those lines, finding a mentor in your organization or in your life yeah, that's, that's is, has been huge for me. It, just really being able to bounce ideas off of and and honestly bring me back down to earth when I would start <laughs> to think above the, you know, the the periphery, just not really focusing on the right things. And then lastly, I would say, don't ever let anybody tell you you can't do something. I cannot tell you how many times I have been thrown into the deep end of the pool, whether that's because I volunteered for extra things to do because I wanted to learn and I didn't know what I was doing, but I have to tell you, like, that's why I've been able to move because I'm, I don't really say no. I'm really excited to learn new things and to be exposed to other parts of my business. And I just think it makes you a better, a better professional all the way around, no matter where you end up, you know, yeah. under from a sales rep perspective, especially like if, if it's either pharma or lab, understanding reimbursement is really important. You can't just only understand your product. You have to understand how it gets exactly. paid for it and all of that. And so, um, you know, those are just off the top of my head, a couple of things that I think need folks really need to have developed in order to be taken seriously when these opportunities come up. Being open, I think, is the other thing. It's just really being open to listening to crazy opportunities. I mean, yeah, I, and don't get pigeonholed into what you've always done. You know, hey, I've always done this, so I'm yes. going to stay here. You know, if you find something and you find that courage, go look at it, research it, do, and go, sure. wow, that sound, that's what I want to do. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that's great advice. Uh, so, so one of the things is, is courage, right? Yeah. Um, making sure that, um, you know, that you have that ability to, to push forward, curiosity. Yes. Uh, and, and the last thing is don't wear your pajamas to an interview like we used to do about, you know, three years ago, right? I know. It's so funny, it, you know, and, and but there, there's always been mishaps. I had one guy one time come in for interviews and he had to fly in and they lost his luggage and he, he had sweatpants on. That's what he flew in. So he had his interview in it and it was hilarious. And I, he ended up getting the job and we laugh about it to this day, but you know, things happen, but trying to put the best foot forward is always, I think. Awesome. Yeah. Smart. Sorry. And we're going to wrap up the segment yeah. again. We can't thank you enough for being here, but what's the future look like for, for Aaron Feeney? What, what's the future look like? For I you? think the future is really bright. I think there's, there's so many things, uh, there's so much going on in this space. You know, I, I'm, thoroughly in love with the lab business, thoroughly in love with pathology and really feel like um, the sky is sort of the limit. We just need to get some of those other po points in play, you know, reimbursement and FDA and all of that. But that's all going to come because this is the future and yeah. um, getting to precision medicine, particularly for oncology patients is, is the Holy grail and we're moving closer to it every day. That's awesome. Thanks so much. We really appreciate it. Looking Thanks, forward to our next conversation. Sounds good. Have a great day. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. For the video recording of this podcast, along with additional resources, make sure to find us on the web at SureGSolutions.com and follow us on social media and LinkedIn at SureGSolutions.